what is multicultural London English? Um, I have a definition here from Kircher and Fox, uh, who wrote, MLE is used to describe the speech of young people in multi-ethnic areas of London, regardless of the speaker's own ethnic background and their gender. A lot of young Londoners now use MLE instead of the Cockney dialect that's traditionally associated with London. So that's a definition. But what does it actually sound like? So um, the best place to find MLE online, I think, is an interview with people in the music industry. So I have a sample of two guys here. This is Big Zoo. So it's all sins. Then I have to hold that. Do you know what I'm trying to say? But I feel like in my heart, my intention is pure yes i do music to help my family and have fun and enjoy and not all my songs are just straight positive like some songs i'm saying i'm gonna do this to man and i'll do this to man and i'll punch man up and my boy's doing this and da -da -da, but it's because i'm reflecting of where i've come from i'm not glorifying it yeah and then um this is morrison way back that was like the one that that, that video that was shot in the ruthless record shot was SBTV. It was SBTV, you know. I was one of the first artists on there to do numbers kind of thing, like really, it was a big thing at the time, not because at the time it's the first time people see that I was wet. So it was the first time people heard my music, but they didn't know I was wet. And then Jamal brought that camera up, I'd done that freestyle, and then bang, wow, it's a big thing. His, his geezer's wet. This Morrison geezer's wet. Wow. So that's, that's that. Now, um... Who speaks MLE and, and when? So the, the way we see it, MLE is on a, on a continuum from a vernacular variety to a youth style. So what say vernacular? Well, it has two meanings. One is that it refers to a local dialect or accent, not a standard, not standard language. The other is more psycholinguistic, shall we say. It's the language that we grew up with, the language that we use when we're paying least attention to our language, most relaxed. So it's somehow semi-hardwired. Um, so the vernacular, or should we say core speakers of multicultural London English are usually working class. Um, minority ethnic speakers use it more strongly, but it's not confined to them by any means. Elements of MLE, especially slang, are available to other speakers, including middle class speakers, as a part of, of a youth style. So <clears throat> what's MLE like? Well, I can, I'll start by talking about vowels. Um, the, the diphthongs in words like goat, face, price, and mouth are, are distinctive. So let me try, first of all, the, the Cockney accent. So pardon my Cockney. Goat, face, price, and mouth. Okay. So if I uh, then proceed to, to say this in, in MLE, we get something like goat, face, price, and mouth. Another distinctive vowel is the, the vowel in words like goose, the oo vowel which is almost like an E, but not quite. So it comes out something like oo, goose, something like that. It's also a feature of the, of the South of England, but it's more pronounced in MLE. What about consonants? Well, one striking thing is that even though Cockney, London's dialect is H dropping, MLE is not. So we talk about H reinstatement. So we have pronunciations like go home, my house. Unlike Cockney it would be something like go home, my house. Um, so that's a distinctive thing. Then there's TH fronting and TH stopping. Okay, now what's, what, what are these? So th is sometimes pronounced th with an F in words like thing. And this, of course, is true of many other British English accents as well, so it's not specific to MLE. Word initial th is often replaced with d. So we have dare, for instance, and this is pretty much MLE only. Word initial th may be replaced actually with t, but only in the word thing and in pronouns containing things. So something like, so you could hear the word thing and something. And this is also Emily only. This one is a bit different, so k backing. So k is back to k before what we call non-high back vowels. So, whereas in, in, uh, in the other varieties of English, you might hear car, cousin, college, in MLE, you're likely to hear car, cousin, college, with a quite a different k sound. Technically, we call this a uvular plosive. And then we have a new pronoun, man. And I'd like you to just listen to this to get an idea of, of, of how it's used. 
I don't mind how my girl. I don't really mind how how my girl looks. If she looks decent, yeah, and there's one bit of her face that just looks mashed, yeah, I don't care. It's her personality, man's looking at. I'm not even looking at the girl pop like that. Okay, so it so it means uh, it can be used for the first person, but it can be third person as well. It can be a, a generic pronoun. These are the project uh, projects that I was involved with in the first part of the first decade of this century with Jenny Cheshire, Sue Fox, Aidan Dawson, Arfan Khan. And we focused on uh, three London boroughs, but today I'm only, mainly going to be talking about Hackney, the inner city um, here, which you can see, which is highly multi-ethnic. I said multi-ethnic, so that, what's, the, what's the cause of the multi-ethnicity, if you like? Well, it's to do with migration, and we saw a very big increase in immigration from 1948. So this was people from the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, but also followed by people from South Asia, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And then from the 1980s onwards, we find people from, from West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, those sort of countries, Somalia, Turkey, South America, North Africa, and many other places. And from 2004, immigration from Eastern Europe, notably Poland, but that's not so relevant for MLE just yet. We don't know what effect the, the young Poles will, will have. The obverse of this immigration is actually outward migration of existing populations in the inner city of, of London to new housing in surrounding counties after the Second World War. Okay, so focusing in then on Hackney, we have a, a borough that in uh, 20 years ago was 44.12% white British, but so in other words, under half were white British, and then various other ethnicities here, including uh, Black Caribbean and, and, and Black African, plus Indian and a number of others. This gives some idea of, of the kind of uh, ethnic composition uh, that there was at that time and still is today. Okay. Did MLE have precursors? Well, yes, it did, obviously. So the, the linguistic repertoire of the first immigrants was, was like this from the 50s to 60s. So the main group was white British, and the second largest group, or still relatively small, was the Af were the African Caribbeans, mainly from Jamaica. And they formed the, the main groups here. The linguistic repertoires of these two groups were based on their ancestral languages. So with London vernacular added for the Caribbean children, we get this. So the white British had London vernacular as their ancestral language, the language they, they continued speaking, uh, plus various forms of standard English learned at school and so on. As for the young uh, African Caribbeans, well, they also spoke London vernacular the, the same way as the white British did. But in addition to that, they had Jamaican Creole, which was their with the language of the home very often of the parents who were themselves immigrants from the Caribbean or, or from Jamaica in this case. And then we see another change. We see the rise of something called London Jamaican, something quite distinct. Youth worker and criminologist John Pitts notes the start of a new youth language among young black people in the East End in the early 1970s when their deteriorating social position was preventing them from living up to their parents' expectations. So Pitts says in his lecture that the young black Londoners at first spoke with a Cockney accent, like Ian Wright, the black footballer. And then in a few short years, they all sounded like Bob Marley, the Jamaican reggae artist. Now it's clear that this is, this is not the forerunner of MLE because it was not used by white British young people. And interestingly also, it was, it was the form of language that was then acquired by other black adolescents with no Jamaican heritage from other parts of the Caribbean. Mark Seber calls it London Jamaican. Pitts argues that this new Jamaican influence variety reflects a resistance identity. Okay, move on a few more years and Mark Seber and Roger Hewitt note what they call an intermediate black cockney or multi-ethnic multiracial vernacular. Now, this was apparently for use in adolescent peer groups only, but significantly regardless of ethnic group. It was not a vernacular in spite of its name, but it was a style that was put on and taken off, so to speak. It had many Cockney features, but some Creole mixed in. I think we can see seeds of Emily 
in the in these comments. In other words, the idea that this is a form of language that's not strongly ethnic in its orientation. What about MLE then? Well, um, there was no there were no published studies on London youth language after Severs and Hewitt's uh, 1980s research. So our projects in 2004 to 10 were the first to note the existence of a new vernacular. To some extent, as I said, it was ethnically neutral. It was relatively stable. Its pronunciation features were the most striking aspect, um, as, I, as I've already pointed out. Now, we date the beginnings of MLE to the generation born in the mid 1970s. And we gave it the label Multicultural London English in 2006. The press at that time got hold of this idea of a new dialect, and they decided to call it Jeff Aiken. Um, but this term is less used now with MLE in the ascendancy. And then there are a couple of, of references you might want to follow up on, on, on this point at the bottom there. Right. What about the possible origins of MLE features? Well, the vowels of Galt and Face could be Caribbean, they could be West African, they could be Indian, Englishes, that is referring to English. Um, they could come from Northern England or they could come from Scotland, although probably the demographics being as they are, not likely that they have a, that are a British origin, but they might well have had a learner variety origin. The people learning English as a second language often end up with those vowels. The vowel of goose, the goose vowel, well, it's very Southern English actually, Definitely not Caribbean Englishes, definitely not African Englishes, and so on. H, re H reinstatement. Well, this is not Jamaican because Jamaican English and Jamaican Creole are both H dropping varieties. And the same is also true of Yoruba speakers of English. They also drop their H's. And they are, of course, the two of the major contributors, if you like, to the multi ethnic population. Could it be the standard forms of English encountered in school? Um, possibly, but you have to note that MLE has mainly non-standard features in terms of its, its grammar, uh, in terms of other pronunciation features like the glottal stop, to say little and letter like other Londoners do. What about TH stopping? This could be the, from the Caribbean, it could be from Africa, could also be learner varieties. As for K backing, well, I don't have any suggestions, well, maybe you do. Um, as for the man pronoun, possibly Jamaica, but the way it's used in London differs a lot from Jamaican Creole. So it's, it's basically homegrown. Now, in this list we've just seen, Caribbean and Jamaican origins are mentioned the most often in this list. Is there a Jamaican advantage? And I want to address this point now. Um, what about the demographic explanation? So um, the early post-World post War II immigrants were the founders. And here we, we, we note uh, Salikoko Mufwene's founder effect. This is the idea that founding populations set the feature baseline for a speech community. So the kind of language features that they had are the ones that then survive through to later generations. But just how many people were actually involved in these migrations? You can see lists here for Croydon and Hackney today um, the, the actual uh, proportions of each of these three ethnicities is still quite low. Um, and across the board, though, across London, uh, it's London English speakers who are in a large majority compared to speakers of any single other language. Not across the board, uh, count, counting all the non English languages together, but uh, taking individual languages. Okay. I mean, uh, the, 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 pop, the, the white British population of, of London is, is below 50%, I think, across, right across. Okay, who were these, uh, who were these um, founders? Well, 802 migrants from the Caribbean colonies who arrived in London on the Empire Windrush in 1948. And here are two quite well-known photos that, that we see quite, quite frequently. So these were the guys and young women as well who arrived back then and laid the foundation. Right, <clears throat> now let's have a look at the actual uh, demo demographic figures here. So this chart shows uh, as a timeline across the bottom. It also then it has three lines, one for West Indians, i.e. Caribbean, another for Indians, another for Pakistanis. Let's look at the West Indian line, which is the dot superimposed on the straight line. And we can see that the, the, that the numbers rise steeply in about 1953 
and continue rising until 1960 and then fall down rapidly. And in the meantime, Indians play catch up, but only after the, after the 60s, really, in the 70s, in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, the Indians are then in, in the ascendancy in terms of numbers of migrants coming to, coming to Britain. And the Pakistanis follow on behind. Okay, um, so that gives you some picture of the sort of the time-wise precedence of, of the West Indians. So, what kind of arguments can we adduce now then? Even though the Caribbeans remained a small percentage of the population, could there still be a founder effect? Let's look more closely at, at Hackney. Now, in 2011, there were, uh, there were, we had a, a census which established the numbers and, and the residences are also of, of different ethnic groups. So I've chosen the four largest here, uh, the white British, black Caribbean, black African and Indian. Which focus on the Black Caribbean group because that's the one we're concerned with today. So this is like a heat map. So the more red or more yellow things are, the greater the number per hectare of people of this particular ethnic ethnic group are, are residing. Um, so you can see that it seems to be you know on the, the eastern side of of, of the borough, um, but there are high numbers throughout the borough, and that's sort of repeated throughout London really. So the point here is that um, the um, uh, that they were part of the founding population. So there are concentrations of particular groups, and we're talking about migrants now, really, um, particular groups like the African Caribbeans. And the fact that they are quite numerous in particular areas, like those red areas on the previous slide, means that the effects, their linguistic effects. Can be, it might, might be amplified, at least at the local level. And then lack of segregation facilitated contact and therefore spread of linguistic influence. They, they were not segregated. Um, they lived cheek by jowl with, with, with the white British population. And an interesting point is, and I think it's important, their language was at least partly intelligible to the existing Anglophone population unlike the case for the languages from the Indian subcontinent and Africa that were introduced later. And of course, they were mostly literate in English anyway, so they could also speak English. But then the influence of Jamaican popular culture and music was pervasive quite early on, and there's lots of literature on, on this, and it continues today. And this is a striking fact. Jamaican slang in grime and drill music uh, is prevalent, even though many artists are actually of Ghanaian and Nigerian, other African descent, so no Caribbean link, but a Caribbean heritage with those people. And then the take home slide here. Um, demography, contact and culture are all important. Demographic explanations work to some extent in explaining the persistence of some, of some Jamaican Creole features in MLE. It could be the vocabulary slang, but it could also be in some, but not all, the vowel sounds. Like you can't tell exactly there's Jamaica and not somewhere else very often. So this linguistic influence is only possible if there's contact between speakers. And this, as I said, existed early on between the Caribbeans and the white British population. And finally, we need to take account of cultural factors, especially popular music. Thank you.